Say what you want about Fallout 4, but you have to admit, power armor actually makes you feel, well, powerful. From the walking sounds, to the clunky yet delightfully retrofuturistic HUD, to shoulder checking raiders into oblivion, to the superhero landing that negates fall damage, you really feel like an unstoppable walking tank of a man. But one criticism many have with power armor in Fallout 4 is the fusion core system. Sure, this little doohickey can power a building for 200 years, but in power armor, the best they can do is 20 minutes. Yes, it limits your use of power armor so you can't become too easily overpowered, but it not only doesn't fit into the lore, it's basically inconsequential if you take the scrounger perk, as you can find several fusion cores at once in regular intervals. Now, back to what I was saying about power armor making you feel powerful. Without a fusion core, it does the exact opposite. You can't sprint, can't use vats, can't do anything that uses action points really. Not to mention, you move at a snail's pace. So what if you decided to go on a reverse power trip and be in this useless hunk of metal the entire game? Well, since you all like seeing me suffer, that's the question I'll be answering today as I aim to find out, can you beat Fallout 4 in a power armor frame without fusion cores? The rules are pretty simple. I must be in an empty power armor frame at all times, and I'm not allowed to have any fusion cores in my inventory. I also can't wear anything under the frame. Finally, I'm playing on very hard difficulty with no companions. With all that out of the way, let's begin. After making a cute tomboy named Hardcore Hannah because that's the best name I could come up with, I go with 10 Endurance to make up for my lack of armor, 10 Charisma for bartering, speech checks, and intimidation, and 4 Luck so I can bump it up to 5 and get the Idiot Savant perk. I then immediately put my Vault Suit and Wedding Ring away since I can't wear armor for this challenge. Making it through the vault is a piece of cake. The first roach I trap behind a door, a few more get zapped, and the rest I give the ring around before sneaking, grabbing the pit boy and escaping into the commonwealth. Let me in. Let me in. No time to waste, my only goal right now is to get into a power armor frame as quickly as possible, which sadly means leaving the good doggo behind. Slipping past the raiders under the roof of the church, I jump to the vertebrate, somehow store all the power armor pieces in a little toolbox, and enter the frame, officially starting the run. Now's a good time to tell you what being in an unpowered frame entails. First off, the beeping. The horrible, incessant beeping. Second, your movement speed is severely reduced, similar to being over-encumbered. As far as I can tell, sneaking, aiming, having your weapon out, or being over-encumbered doesn't make you any slower. Unlike being over-encumbered, you can fast travel. Third, you can't do anything that requires AP. This means no gun bashing, no power attacking, and while you can enter vats, you can't attack with it. As for armor, the frame has a damage and energy resistance of 60. Got it? Good. After giving some raiders an express ticket to hell, Sturges types on an invisible keyboard and I get a unique piece of dialogue I've never heard before. Hold up a sec, hotshot. That suit's out of juice. There's a fusion core locked up in the basement. Trust me, you'll want to grab it. At first, I used the minigun to take out the raiders, but that leaves me with no ammo for the Deathclaw. The second time around, I use a pipe rifle to slowly pick off the raiders, and the Deathclaw gets so sick of my shit that he comes out of his hole early. No matter, the old hide inside a building trick works as well as ever, and with Preston's gang on their way to Sanctuary, I begin my pilgrimage to Diamond City. On the way, I trade some things with Carla and get ready to take out Wolfgang and Simone, but a Mr. Gutsy swoops in to steal the action. Go fuck yourself, you crazy robot. Analyzing. American colloquialism confirmed. Probability of use by Chinese infiltrator, 0.3%. Thank you. Report any suspected communists to the proper authorities immediately. Have a nice day. I then level up Lux so I can get Idiot Savant later, and keep trudging along until I reach the police station, where I stand back and watch Dance do the hard work, and agree to help his merry band of techno-fetishists. Oh, and I get the idiot savant perk. Might be more humane to just take you out back and shoot you. Remain vigilant. I know this. Place. 
After Dance does a magic trick and makes his helmet disappear, I lag behind him to arc jet and let him vaporize everything on the way. This also applies to the interior, as besides a helpful landmine, I don't do much to help. Despite this, he still congratulates me for my hard work by giving me righteous authority. Respect my authority! And while I can't make use of its crit bonuses, it's still a powerful and reliable gun for the rest of the playthrough. To underscore this point, I get the first rank of Rifleman. After getting lectured and taking on two quests I have no intention of doing, I can finally make it to Diamond City, discovering CIT and Backstreet Apparel on the way. Piper gets a solid whack with a pool cue so I can skip the gate, I snatch the mayor's key for later, get called a synth, protection from Commonwealth weaponry. That armor. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Level up from stealing Myrna's tin cans and get the solar powered perk. I then get sent to rescue Inspector Gadget from the mob, but not before witnessing an NTR roleplay gone wrong and killing everyone involved for maximum profit. Sorry. No witnesses. Are you on drugs or alcohol? No, sir. Do you take drugs or alcohol? What is drugs? On the way to the subway, I kill a mutant with a rocket launcher, kill all the scam artists, and take their stuff. The Triggermen can do a lot of damage quickly with their automatic weapons, but since they don't wear armor, they go down similarly fast. Righteous Authority puts in good work, as it's accurate, can be fired quickly, and I have plenty of ammo for it. For some reason, I switch over to the Junk Jet and I'm immediately reminded how well it lives up to its name. Getting the Demonetization perk for extra damage, I sneak attack Dino, getting him below half health, and watch as he dies from being poisoned, hit by a truck, and subsequently isocate into an alien invasion. With the Metal Man at my side, the rest of the vault goes pretty smoothly. Hey. Exactly subtle, pal. you walk away from. I made sure to pick up literally everything not nailed down so I can afford a particular weapon from a particular merchant. And as luck would have it, she's in town. Truth be told, I was planning on picking up Overseer's Guardian, so my build isn't spec for automatics or explosives. Nevertheless, Prey and Spray is a welcome addition to my arsenal. I then drop a bunch of crap I don't need, test out my gun on another scam artist, grab a mutated fern, and head to Vault 81 to get both the Scrounger's perk and pick up Overseer's Guardian anyways. However, it's far too expensive for me right now. And this is where I fail the run. I have to sit down to talk to Nick and progress the main quest, However, they don't make chairs big enough for my fat ass, and the button to get into Kellogg's room doesn't exist until Nick mentions it, even clipping through the wall doesn't work, so I have to exit the power armor frame and break the rules. Apparently, having a conversation while standing is too much for the clockwork dick to handle. Since I don't want this video to be 8 minutes long, I continue with the challenge despite my failure, taking all of Kellogg's things and letting the good doggo lead me to him. Like hell am I actually following him all the way there as intended, instead I take the much more sensible option and fast travel to Arcjet. From there it's just a short walk to Fort Hagen, where I blow up some turrets, get Wasteland Whisperer, and dismiss the doggo as to not break the rules. The synths do decent damage to me, but I also do good damage to them so it balances out. I do like how these mindless robotic soldiers were programmed to surrender in fear for their lives, for some reason. The rest of the base can be summed up as... Now that I have a lukewarm scoop of Kellogg's Grey Matter in my pockets, I get another rank of Rifleman, blow up some mutants, discover mass fusion, 
continue my streak of killing con artists, and fail the run yet again when I have to exit my frame to sit down in the memory lounger. I've done this quest more times than I can count, so I get up to make myself a snack while Kellogg and X6 yap. Leaving his memories, I get right back in my suit and, for once, don't lie to Dr. Omari. Oh, I'm going in naked. Fingers crossed I get superpowers. Now it's time for the worst part of this run, the glowing sea. Since I have no radiation resistance, I have to pop Radex and Radaway like candy just to survive. Since I move so slowly, running from enemies isn't an option, and with how powerful the enemies are in the glowing sea, that's a problem. Combine that with low visibility, and it leads to a whole lot of... What? Are you fucking kidding me? After getting the intimidation perk, I blast a few scorpions and discover Sentinel Sight, which will be very important later on. I then go to Diamond City to get my rads flushed and to buy as many radiation meds as I can. I also give Solomon some fern and leave before Latimer has a chance to berate me. Making it to the crater isn't so bad, I just have to blast some more scorps and sneak past the Deathclaw. One talk with the Rat Eaters and a stealth boy later, Virgil sends me off to kill Discount Roy Batty. Like Kellogg since, the Gunners deal a large amount of damage quickly, but so do I. Intimidation puts in good work reducing how many I have to fight, and I even get rank 2 of Bloody Mess for more damage. Luckily, I'm able to pacify the prick with a missile launcher, so I don't have to deal with that later. Righteous Authority can easily mop up the rest of the preppers, and with that, it's time to fight the Courser. And by fight, I mean lay down a shit ton of mines and throw a pulse grenade to lure him to his death. Ripping the chip out of his brain, this gunner accepts his fate. Help me. And I leave the toaster behind. Now, as to who I'm siding with, well, the Minutemen will require far too much walking around, and the Institute is a no-go since you have to sit down at least twice to progress their questline. The Railroad is just the Institute questline, but espionage, so that only leaves one choice. Sorry, Toaster Defenders. It's only a matter of time. Taking a joyride up to the Pride Wine, the Elder begins ranting about toasters causing cancer or something, I'm not really paying attention. I try to spice up his speech with some fireworks, but it looks like Max is sitting this one out. Night Captain Cade also doesn't appreciate my fireworks, and the crew turns me into a human bobblehead. Speaking of the crew, meeting them is as simple as ever, if not a little tedious due to my slow speed. I do notice Ingram's wearing a custom power armor frame, and I can respect her for that. I then discover that you can tell the Elder about the teleporter if you rush the main quest first, which is pretty interesting. Fort Strong's my next target, and while the mutants have both high damage and health, a minigun shreds them well enough. A Mirelurk even crawls over to help. After getting a shitty tire iron, a pretty badass hunting rifle, and the second rank of Scrounger, I take a peek in a garbage bin only to see Parker Quinn's charge card in there where it rightfully belongs. Wanna join my free charge card giveaway? The inside has a few bullet sponges that almost put me down, but with pacification, drugs, and my Tommy gun, it's doable. Unfortunately, I have to betray the mutants that surrendered because the Brotherhood doesn't take prisoners. A sniper rifle and some grenades end up being my friend in the lower section, and before you know it, the place is cleared out. The Elder wants me to chat with Ingram about the teleporter, and luckily for me, she pops out of thin air just at the right time. Taking the scenic route to the workbench, I scrap everything possible, build the giant metal pizza, shove an entire settlement's worth of junk down my pants, use the special book to put a point into agility for commando, build a bunch of stuff to make Sturgis happy, give Sheffield a new Coca-Cola, light Myrna on fire, and use all the junk from Sanctuary to build a teleporter. I get zapped into energy and put back together on the other side, which begs the question, am I really the same hardcore Hannah as before? Philosophical musings aside, Sean lies to me. Your weapons haven't been confiscated. 
and I stand unarmed before you. Why the fuck you lying? Why you always lying? I get the commando perk, get the meet and greet over with. But I gather you know all this, since you've encountered one already. In fact, I'd very much like to know how you defeated it. I hate to break it to you, but your Courser wasn't all that tough. Riz up Dr. Lee into deserting, get rank 2 of Commando, and come back with a tape pack full of the Institute's dirty laundry. For all we know, that's a recipe for a Deathclaw surprise. Ingram wants to get Liberty Biberty back online, however, Madison Lee is being uncooperative and I need to convince her to help out. I do this using the power of Fallout 4's writing. Ever if you're here to talk me under. into working on Liberty Prime, you can forget it. What changed your mind? Nothing changed my mind. I promised you I'd return to the Brotherhood, and I've kept my end of the bargain. Do I need to remind you why you made that promise in the first place? No, that won't be necessary. Tell Proctor Ingram to get her scribes ready. It's going to take a hell of a lot of work to get Liberty Prime back online. But we'll get it done. My next task is to pick up a high-powered magnet. Luckily, Percy comes in clutch and I can build the five actuators we need. Wait, don't we only need four? Eh, I'm sure they'll find a fifth limb to use the last one on. Now I've got to recover a bunch of nukes, which doesn't really make sense to me. Elder Maxon says that the Fat Man is an essential part of the Brotherhood arsenal. And discounting the fact that we don't see them with Fat Men in game, why not just let Prime use his laser while Knights Fat Men the Institute from a distance? Oh well, I did discover a Sentinel site earlier, so getting there is the easy part. I would say clearing the place out was the hard part, but I'd be lying. Sure, the ghouls pack a punch, but I have so much ammo for my laser rifle I can just spam beams at them with impunity. As for the glowing one, some mines and more beam spamming gets the job done. Unfortunately, the rat eater doesn't come into existence until you chat with Halen, so I have to crawl through molasses all the way there. Using my Riz to both convince the Rat Eater to let me take his radioactive easter eggs and to convince this elevator to not crush me to death, Dr. Lee bitches about me pressing the button to activate Liberty Biberty, I mean, it's a button press for fuck's sake, a mole rat could do it, and I find out that Dance was a toaster the whole time. What a twist! After another mostly uninteresting hike, I turn some bots to slag before using my Riz yet again to convince the Elder that not all toasters are evil. I then try to see if you can shoot down Maxon's vertebrate as it flies away, but because this game hates player choice, his copter activates TGM. Luckily for me, idiot savant procs on this quest, almost leveling me up twice. My next mission is to take out the railroad that I already took out ages ago. I'll try to get it back here in one piece. But not before getting another rank of riflemen. I decide to give the railroad an ironic death by killing them with the thing they love the most, toasters. The rest just take a few molotovs and lasers to escort into the afterlife, and with that, the Thomas the Tang Engine fan club is no more. I then grab the Animal Friend perk since I don't really have anything better to pick. For Mass Fusion, I decide not to bring the good Proctor with me, as I don't want things to be too easy. I know she's not technically a companion, but it still feels a little cheap. Now, I could go down the elevator and have a cool shootout with some toasters, or... So guys, we did it! I try to spawn and then pacify some synths in the hopes they'll help me fight the robots that pop out. As for getting the agitator, my slow walking speed combined with my non-existent rad resistance makes this part pretty hard. I basically just have to chug all my rad and right away to even have a chance at survival. Luckily, rad stacks, so it could have been much, much worse. As for the sentry bot, a nuka grenade, three fat man shells, and some spray and pray clean them up pretty handily. Justice will be administered. <laughs> Spray and Prey also works wonders on the Assaultrons as it blows out their legs, but I run out of 45 ammo in the process. 
The rest can be taken care of by my laser rifle. I've been hoarding useless legendaries and other garbage this whole run, so I might as well get rid of it all before the final mission. I head to Vault 81 and witness another NTR roleplay before buying Overseer's Guardian, which is normally one of the best guns in the game. I also hit up Good Neighbor and DC for 45 ammo and other supplies. After sticking the Beryllium Agitator into Prime's Libertussy, I take an extremely slow and arduous walk all the way to CIT- Nah, I fast travel there and help fend off the toasters with my Guardian Angel. Honestly, getting Overseer's Guardian this late in the game was a mistake. Spray and Prey uses the same ammo, but it's just flat out better due to its explosive effect, while Overseer's Guardian has way too much recoil for its own good. This could be solved if I had the ability to mod weapons, but oh well, too late to complain now. There's not really much to say about clearing out the Institute, as Elder Maxon does most of the work with his cracked Gatling laser. After Father tanks two pulse mines and mini nukes to the face, I just say fuck it and make him dance with Spray and Prey. A few war crimes and accidental Molotovs to the face later, I soften up the reactor room with my missile launcher as Maxon cleans house. With the charge set, I juke out my toaster son. Alright. You can come with me. Really? Do you mean it? On second thought, no. I don't need the baggage. Sorry, kid. You're just gonna leave me here? I can't believe it! I hate you! Leave him with a parting gift, personally evaporate the Institute, and did not beat Fallout 4 in a power armor frame without fusion cores. In conclusion, while this run was very painful at points, it could have been much, much worse. I honestly didn't expect to be able to jump or even activate that, let alone fast travel. The low movement speed sucked, but when I had Spray and Pray and Righteous Authority, nothing much could get near me anyways. The low armor was also a hindrance, but a plethora of healing items and 10 endurance sort of made up for it. Finally, the gunplay has improved so much in Fallout 4 that not being able to fire in vats wasn't that bad of a restriction. Honestly, the most annoying part of this run was the constant beeping noise. I probably wouldn't recommend this playthrough, especially not on survival, but it was refreshing to get a proper challenge for once. Thanks for watching, and if you liked the video, leave a like, subscribe, write a comment, or become a patron. If you didn't enjoy the video, leave a dislike and offer constructive criticism so I can improve. Patrons gain access to exclusive content, have their names at the end of each video and in the description, and any suggestions left by patrons are guaranteed to become official videos. Even if you aren't a patron, I'd still like to hear your feedback and ideas for new videos. This is Causal Loop, signing off. Peace. Peace.